Today I'm going to be talking about something that most people don't think about. I want to challenge uh, the uh, standard thinking on a kind of controversial topic. So feel free to uh, disagree, uh, throw things at me uh, at any time. Uh, the question I'm going to be talking about is, does government need to provide law enforcement? This is something that pretty much uh, everybody, almost every single person says yes. Uh, and that's going to be my topic. Uh, I'm going to start by asking, what would happen? What do you think would happen if government did not provide law enforcement? What are some examples that come to mind? Bad things, right? Uh, Lord, Lord of the Flies. Uh, they didn't have government, and the children on the island, they were very mean to each other, right? They uh, did very horrible things. Uh, other examples. Mad Max, uh, for those of you who've seen it, uh, it's just total chaos. You go out and like, people are just swinging axes at you and very horrible, unpleasant things. Um, other things, the Wild West, right? The vigilantes that we're talking about, uh, where people just get in gunfights, they get in uh, brawls at bars, all these horrible things that uh, we don't like. Uh, an extreme form of vigilante justice was the Hatfield and the McCoys in West Virginia, where these two families had a dispute, and then decades and decades later, they're still fighting each other, taking the law into their own hands, and not, not a good situation uh, at all. Or what else? Anarchists, right? If we don't have government, we're going to have anarchists with black masks going around, bombing things, burning Wendy's. Can you think of anything worse than that? We don't want to have uh, stuff like this. Uh, and so basically, the most common position is elaborated here by John Locke, the political philosopher from England. He said, in a state of nature, okay, this is without government, he says, there wants a known and indifferent judge with authority to determine all differences according to established law. For everyone in that state, being both judge and executioner of the law, he says, with men being partial to themselves, passion and revenge is apt to take them too far. Okay, so without government, people are going to be biased in their own cause, and they're going to engage in a lot of bad behavior. Okay, so this is the issue. Uh, chaos is bad. Pretty much everybody uh, agrees on that. The proposed solution, a government monopoly over the use of force. So that's why we have the police, the friendly police with their uh, dogs, their horses. We have the courts, the blind justice. They don't care about uh, their own personal thing. They just weigh the evidence and decide who's best. We have our friendly justices who are here to... Uh, help us decide disputes. Here's a stamp that I found. World peace through law. We just need more law and we can have world peace. We have the military, the army, the navy, the air force, the marines with these values. Loyalty, service, put the welfare of the nation, the army, and your subordinates before your own. Respect. Treat people as they should be respected. Live up honor. Live up to all honor army values, integrity, do what's right legally and morally. Uh, so these are the things that enable us to have our way of life, peace in society. So thank you very much. I've, I've enjoyed speaking with you. <laughs> OK, so I'm an economist. And I have to say, all right, this is one side of the picture. But is that the complete picture? Is there another side, and are these certain things that we have not, most people have not been looking at? And just to present part of the other side of the picture, I'm just going to say there's some other things that government does that aren't necessarily promoting this uh, type of lifestyle. And we can see things like this. Government often uses guns against people, uh, threatens people. Um, this was in the early 90s, uh, Janet Reno. I'm not very good at interpreting body language, but 
when someone walks around like this, it looks like they're very angry. Um, and she was in power when they, a um, uh, hundred or so people in uh, Texas got killed. Uh, in addition to uh, people getting killed, uh, people get beaten. Uh, government uses guns against, uh, oftentimes against Americans. This is kind of a famous picture from Kent State. Uh, I think this is, I guess, in the 60s sometime. Uh, in college, I went to College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts, and the courthouse said, obedience to law is liberty. So there's a lot of things that government does which seems like they're saying one thing, but they're doing another thing. So this is one of my favorite Orwellian quotes. Another thing that government does is they create large armies. They sometimes create wars, uh, sometimes lots and lots of people die due to governments, okay? So just because we have government uh, doesn't necessarily mean we're going to solve all these problems that I mentioned earlier. And the question I'm going to ask, just because something is important, does it follow that government should provide it? Does it follow that government should provide, have a monopoly over it? And, uh, and I'm gonna ask that question about police in a minute. So imagine the following argument. Food is important. We all, we all need food. We all need the four food groups. Although, by the way, Alex, you, should, you need to get off those carbs. It's bad, uh, bad thing. Uh, we all know that food is, is important. But does it follow that government should have a monopoly over the provision of food? Uh, most people would say no. If you have a government monopolize the food industry, this is what you see. In Russia, you see shortages, lack of food, lack of selection. Go into the stores in the Soviet Union and the sh shelves would be bare. You just did not have the same choices. Uh, in the Soviet Union, not at all the time, though. what's that? Not at all the time. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but if you contrast it to Whole Foods, <laughs> you can have whatever you want at any time. Okay, so most people would say, well, if we want to have a large selection of food, we should have competition. We should have private markets. We should have Whole Foods <laughs> grocery store providing us with all of these great things uh, that we want. Another question, should government monopolize the automobile industry? What would happen if government monopolized the automobile industry? We have cars which are a little bit maybe imperfect. <laughs> According to one magazine, uh, this is the Yugo. It's called the, the worst car of all time. Uh, this was made by the government in uh, Yugoslavia during the 80s. <clears throat> Should the government mo monopolize the auto industry? Pretty much everybody, with a few exceptions, maybe our current president, um, say no, there should be competition. There should be lots of car companies, car companies from uh, Japan, from Europe, from America competing. When you have competition, you have better products, better service. If one company doesn't do a good job, you get to go to the other company. Um, so my argument here is that most arguments that you hear in favor of government providing and monopolizing something like police are non sequiturs, as in the conclusions don't follow from the pre uh, premises. Something is so important, it doesn't follow that government needs to have a monopoly over it. And the question I'm going to ask is, if markets can provide all those other things, food, groceries, cars, why can't they provide things like law? That's kind of the question that I'd like to, to ask right now. Now, there are certain theorists. Has anybody seen the new Atlas Shrugged movie? Did you like it? I did. Okay, great. I, I, haven't, I can't wait to see it. Um, Ayn Rand is a novelist and a political philosopher. And she said, markets are great in all other areas, but you can't have markets you can't have competition when it comes to law enforcement. You need government to monopolize that industry. She gives the following uh, example. She says, suppose Mr. Smith, a customer of government A, 
suspects his next door neighbor, Mr. Jones, customer of government B, has robbed him. A squad of police A proceeds to Mr. Jones' house and is met at the door of a squad of police B who declare they do not accept the validity of Smith's complaint and do not recognize the authority of government A. What happens then? You take it from there. Okay, so the vision is these competing police agencies constantly coming at war with each other. So imagine that. You've got your police, your neighbor has their police, and what are they going to do, right? There's just going to be a uh, conflict. <laughs> I don't know what this picture is, but I just found it on the internet. So, okay. So that sounds bad. We don't want to have lots of police warring in front of your, na in, in front of your house every time you have a dispute. That sounds horrible. And I'm going to ask, can this question be solved? And point out that actually this question is already currently solved privately in many ways in the current world. So you guys go to a uh, public school, but imagine this is a private school, as many schools are. When you have a dispute with your roommate, if you live on campus, do you call up the uh, Denver police? Most people don't call up the Denver police. They call up campus security. Um, you, you can see this pretty much at every college. Some colleges have full uh, deputized police forces where they have just as many powers as government police. Uh, they also have very informal security systems at pretty much every college. Uh, at my college, the first thing that would happen if you had a dispute is you would call up your residence advisor on your floor and say, my roommate's being mean to me. Can you help me? <laughs> He's playing the stereo too loud. <laughs> it's hurting my feelings. That's the first thing that you do when you have a dispute on your college. If you can't solve it with your resident advisor, the next person who would solve it at my college was the complex director. He was an adult, lived on, uh, in our uh, dorm area. If that doesn't work, you then can call the dean of students. Okay, there are these la layers of enforcement ability. Uh, and finally, you've got, the, uh, you've got the associate dean of students and the dean of students. And in my college, I'm, uh, I'm Episcopalian, but I went to a Catholic college, and the, the, the uh, dean of students, he was a very scary guy. <laughs> so whatever happened, you don't want to cross him because he's basically like the Supreme Court of the college. If you want to continue to be a student at the college, you've got to make sure that this guy is not angry at you. Okay, so there's a very c complex system of resolving uh, disputes. They don't have the same appearance of government law enforcement. They don't wear uniforms. They don't wear robes. But nevertheless, they're providing a lot of the same services of dispute resolution that government law enforcement provides, police and courts. Um, in addition, and, and this turned out to be a great situation. I was very happy with my college. In addition to colleges, we can see other examples of private rule enforcement, private security. Disney, yes, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, locally, the uh, transit system has private security. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I'd like to... I'd like to learn more about that. I'm researching the uh, railroad police in North Carolina right now. So, yeah, I'd love to hear more details about how they work. Uh, I've also done research of, uh, they had that in San Francisco uh, as well. So one major one that you guys have all seen is the private police at Disney. There's more private security, more you could call them private police, in Disney than there are public police in Anaheim. Um, what happens when you go to Disney? Is it like scary? There are these robbers going around stealing from you, saying your money or your life? Are these mice going to mug you? No. Why does Disney provide security? They want you to be happy, right? A profit-motivated company wants you to be happy, and bundled with the price of admission is security, private security, uh, who will help you. They'll actually even pose in photos with you. 
So really all these wonderful benefits that you can get with private, for-profit security that you don't see uh, government police providing. Other examples, uh, mall cops. I haven't seen these movies, but I think it's amazing and exciting that Hollywood is producing movies about private security. That's amazing. It's great. Um, malls have to make sure their customers are safe, right? If people get mugged, that's going to decrease the value of the mall and decrease the revenue for the mall. Uh, they also need to protect the stores from being uh, having shoplifters, so they often have very elaborate systems of private security. So the security thing that we're talking about, most people assume government needs to provide it, large part provided already privately. Shopping malls, other examples, Las Vegas, right? They need to be sure that not only are the uh, customers not stealing from them, they also have to prevent the uh, dealers from stealing against them. They can't exactly rely on the government police to make sure that people aren't stealing. So they've got this very elaborate system where they're monitoring everything at all times, making sure people are not uh, doing things that violate their rules. Um, for those of you who saw that movie, uh, I think it was called 21, with the uh, card counting, bringing down, it's about the book, Bringing Down the House, you'll know that they are very diligent about making sure people follow the rules. They actually share information between casinos if they know that a card counter is in town, just to make sure that uh, things are going properly. So here's some examples. Uh, I'm sure that we can think of some others. Uh, I, I'd like to research the uh, local example more. Um, we can see all over the United States, we've got examples of private security, private rule enforcement at a local level. Now, can this be extended? How far? Do we have this working at a global level? Maybe it can work in Disney, but it, it can't work at a global level. Well, uh, many people argue, well, yes, you can have certain things, but you need government to oversee everything. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to have uh, peaceful interaction. And this sentiment is summed up by Thomas Hobbes. He says, before the names of just and unjust can have place, there must be some course of power to compel men to performance of their covenants by the terror of punishment. Such power there is none before the erection of a commonwealth. He goes on to argue that you need a monopoly over uh, people to have enforcement. And I'm going to ask some of the same types of questions about how do people actually solve disputes when you're from different countries. How, imagine there's two people. Suppose Mr. Jones and Mr. Smith have a dispute. Uh, Mr. Jones, I'm going to call my police to, to uh, get you. Mr. Smith, I don't recognize the authority of your police. As Ayn Rand said, what happens then? You take it from there. So today we have lots of people from different countries interacting every single day, and they don't have one United Nations to solve their disputes. So Alex, you know this guy, right? He's French, one of these guys. Which one, that one? No. <laughs> so, these people from different countries get in a dispute, and who do they call? The United Nations? Government? They call a private judge. <laughs> they privately contracted with the League to say, we're from different countries. We're going to have one judge uh, solve our disputes for us. And there's no need for government to solve this uh, situation. It's quite the same thing with international, all international trade. You're interacting with someone from across the globe. You have a dispute. You can't call them into your local court. You can't go to their court to um, get them to, to sue them. You could, but it would be very costly. Uh, and so there's this jurisdictional issue. No one nation has jurisdiction over all people. 
And so there's this dilemma. You could deal with it in a few different ways. One way, if you have a dispute internationally, you could call the person up and say, Alex, Alex, I hate you. Give me my money. <laughs> I hate you, Alex. Give me my money. That's one option. That's probably not going to work so well. Another option is we can arm wrestle. <laughs> Give me my money. Yes, you would. Um, there's all these potential things. There's a lot of potential problems. But as we see in the real world, whenever there's money at stake, private parties have an incentive to create arrangement to minimize the cost of disputes. You don't want to get into a business relationship if it's going to be chaos. And so internationally and in the United States as well, people sign different things like arbitration clauses. Arbitration clause is basically a private court. You're opting in to a private court anytime you sign an arbitration clause. Has anybody signed an arbitration clause here? Where, where did you sign it? I was uh, working as a consultant. OK, how about you? OK. Every single person in this room has signed an arbitration clause with your cell phone contract, your credit card contract. I think there's some restrictions on some of these now, but you've opted into a system of private courts. In the event of a dispute, you promise not to go to the government courts. You promise to go to a private tribunal. So there's a whole system of private courts. Uh, they're often much more informal. Mediation, that's another alternative dispute resolution mechanism where it's about building bridges and holding hands and making sure people are happy. It's not a litigious system. It's more of a conciliatory system. Uh, in addition to arbitration, we have things like bonding mechanisms. Uh, if you need to deposit money with an escrow agent, uh, the escrow agent can pay a certain party. If in the event of a dispute, there's other things like reputation mechanisms. People rely on a lot of informal mechanisms uh, rather than uh, government. Another common one that we have uh, in the United States is when you have a contract with your security dealer, your stockbroker. That's also governed by private rules, the National Association of Securities Dealers. They've got a very elaborate uh, review system, claims received. Uh, you select arbitrators. There's a pre-hearing, discovery, hearings held, arbitra arbitrators deliberate, award is written and served. So it is in many ways formal, but it's private. It's non-governmental. Another example is eBay. This happened to me. This was horrible. I was buying these Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen buttons, and they didn't send them to me. And I was devastated. It was the worst day of my life. So first I called up the President of the United States to try and get my buttons. Well, he didn't take my call. I called the FBI, CIA. Nobody took my call. I called the local police. They, whatever reason, I don't know why. They didn't, they didn't want to listen to me. So it was horrible. Has anybody had this happen to them on eBay? This is, this is a common problem, right? You, you get defrauded all the time. This actually didn't happen. I did get my Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen buttons. Why did the person send it to me? How do I know? How do you know on eBay that you're going to get your stuff? Yeah, OK, the feedback. 99% chance that this person is going to deliver what you want. Sometimes it doesn't work, but for the most part, it works. And this is a private mechanism for ensuring contractual performance. In addition to the uh, uh, reputation mechanisms on eBay, they have escrow accounts. If you want to do something more formal, I think that costs a little bit more. Uh, but you do have tons of options uh, on eBay. So what I want to make, uh, the case I want to make, is local, locally produced order is very common. We mentioned all these examples of private security. We've also uh, exampled, uh, sorry, given examples of private order at a larger level, internationally. And the question I want to ask is, how far can we extend this? Do you think we could just keep pushing, peeling away some of the layers of government, and having more and more private dispute resolution mechanisms, more and more private 
police, more and more private courts. Uh, some people say, well, maybe it can work to a limited extent, but um, globally it would just be too difficult if we just had only, gov only private solutions. Douglas North, the Nobel laureate, and others basically make the following argument. They say, okay, yeah, on a small scale you can contract with your neighbors, but wouldn't it be difficult to contract with everybody around the world if there was not one government enforcing rules? How would you have private rules with strangers? That would be too difficult. Go ahead, yeah. I was yeah. going to say, even, you know, your examples you gave, like, you know, Disney World and all that, there's a point at which they interact with the local police because if there's a felony, they don't go to court, you know, like Mickey Mouse court. <laughs> 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 you're, you're, you're right that, um, that those are operating within, within a system of government. And the question I'm asking is, could we peel away some of those layers? Um, and, and I'll mention uh, in, a, in a few minutes, there are some historical examples of private communities interacting without any government at all. Um, but I, just within the current, current world, I want to say, you know, could it work without, without having the ability to call on the government police. And this is an open question. You don't have to agree with me on this. Um, but the, the argument against it is, oh, it's, it'd be too high transaction costs. We just couldn't deal with signing contracts with everybody at once. And the example I want to give that might be illustrative of how markets can overcome problems like this is the credit card market. Credit card market is quite fascinating. You can go anywhere in the world that you want. I actually, this was fascinating. I went to uh, the Bahamas a couple weeks ago with Alex, and it was great. I just took this piece of plastic, and I went everywhere. I didn't have any Bahamian money or anything. Took this piece of plastic, and they were like, they were like you need to pay us for my, the meals that we ordered and, and those drinks that we ordered, too. And I was like, I don't have any money, but I have a great scam. I'm going to give them this piece of plastic, and then I'm going to walk away. I'm going to walk away, go back to the United States. I'm never coming back to that restaurant ever again. And all I had to do is he just looked at my piece of plastic, and I didn't have to pay. It was amazing. What happened, what I realized was when I got home, I was sent a bill in the mail. So it was terrible. Um, the point I want to emphasize is the credit card enables complete strangers all over the world who have no relationship with each other to interact. They don't need to know anything about my credit history, anything about my bank account. All they need to know is I have this piece of plastic, and if I can furnish this piece of plastic, they know that they're going to get paid. The relationship then becomes between me and my credit card company rather than me and them uh, specifically. Uh, so you've got stores. Uh, connected to the network, customers connected to the network. Everybody is connected, uh, and they have an elaborate system of dispute resolution mechanisms as well. If there's a fraudulent transaction, they have mechanisms for dealing with it. If they think your credit card has been stolen, they will deactivate all these different things to make sure that uh, people pay what they owe and people get what they owe. And with all of this elaborate system, it's only like one or two or three percent per transaction. So transaction costs exist, but they are not prohibitive. So the lesson that I want to stress for all of this is when a need exists, profit opportunity often exists. They have incentives to figure out solutions, and credit cards are just one example. So to start wrapping up, I want to say that money is actually an incentive for people to solve problems. Private markets create incentives for people to please customers in ways that government doesn't. So the conclusions that I want everybody here in the room to agree with is that right now we have much more private security than most people think. That's one thing I think we can all agree on. Also courts, arbitration, that's also common. Uh, so the idea that private provision is impossible, that's simply untrue. I think everybody should be able to agree on that. How far we extend it, I'll let you decide uh, if you want to go all the way or just part of the way. Um, but the lessons that I want to stress are the fact that 
private markets have incentives that are very different uh, from government. Government that does a bad job, there's really not much penalty for them. Private markets, if you do a bad job, what happens? You go bankrupt. So there's that built-in incentive for private parties to please the customer uh, compared to a co coercive monopoly. Uh, the other thing is market relationships are voluntary. All these examples I gave you, your relationship with your credit card, with your college, with the casino, these are all voluntary. You've opted in to deal with these contractual relationships, and as such, they need to be beneficial to you. If they weren't beneficial to you, you wouldn't go to Disney. You want to do this. Government relationships, are they voluntary? It's not so clear. I would argue that they're not. You have to pay the police taxes whether you like it or not. Government police can do a bad job, and you just have to give them money whether you like it or not. So that's a major, major difference there. Um, and to sum up and wrap up, the main message I want to get across is just because something is important does not mean it should be provided by government. Markets, in my opinion, work so well in every other area. Why not extend their reach in the area of security and adjudication of disputes, uh, too? And if anybody's interested in doing some future readings, I can give you uh, one recommendation. One uh, journal editor, Roderick Long, recommends the following book. He says, this nearly 700-page book is quite simply the definitive collection on private law enforcement. He calls it free market an anarchism. This here and now is it. And it's by far the best book in the world. Do you know what, which one I'm talking about? Um, I think I could guess. <laughs> <laughs> Anarchy and the Law by Ed Stringham. <laughs> Uh, all right, thanks so much. Uh, I want to have some questions and discussion uh, and follow up. Yeah, go ahead. Well, what role does uh, privatization of prisons right now have? Is there any like, comparison or any governments that may be looking at that as a model? Yeah, you know, that's a very tricky question because we have had a huge explosion of privately provided prisons over the past few decades. So. Uh, it's quite interesting, but one of the issues some people uh, question it is the government is still deciding who gets to go into those prisons. So in uh, Michael Moore's uh, movie, Capitalism, A Love Story, he criticized private pr prisons, and he looked at how some pr prison was paying bribes to government judges to have more involuntary customers. So here, basically, we've got a private entity kind of in bed with, with the government judges. So in my own opinion, I do think it's interesting, but I'm not necessarily too jazzed about it because we've got a lot of people. Uh, the government yeah, I mean, um, uh, the economist Bruce Benson has this article called Third Thoughts on Contracting Out. And he says, as long as government is creating the laws and deciding who gets locked up, we don't want to have a more efficient prison system. And I agree with that. Yeah? Well, say hypothetically that you know, we have like an entire private uh, security, no, no police officers at all. Um, if I was a felon or a criminal, um, just the least criminal, what would be my incentive to follow the law? I mean, you are not the law, so therefore I would not. I, I, I don't have an incentive to actually follow the rules because you, you're, not, you're not the government. I would say in the same way that people have to follow the rules at Disney, even if you know, someone didn't want to follow the rules at Disney, they kind of have to, otherwise they're going to be shown the door. Uh, people follow the rules at their college. I mean, I actually think people, a lot of people want to follow the rules at their college, but even if assuming bad motives, People follow the rules at their college because they have to follow the rules at their college. People follow the rules at their work because they have to. If, they're, if, they, can't, if they don't follow the rules, they're fired or they're escorted off of the property uh, in the same way. You go to a restaurant and you break the rules, you're escorted 
off the property. So I'll let you uh, follow. Oh, go ahead. But, but private security doesn't make laws. So, I mean, if I was just, if, let's say I was running the wrong for example, you can't score me off the herd. So, <laughs> well, you know, uh, there have been examples. Uh, San Francisco, for example, has a long history of uh, fully deputized private police. And in the uh, 1850s, they were founded during the time of the gold rush because there wasn't a lot of government police. And it was, you know, in certain ways chaotic. But then the merchants said, we're going to hire and create our own private police force. And they actually did deal with things like murder. Um, in some cases, they would just, you know, if someone was just a bad person, they would ask them to leave the city. But in one case, there was a politician who killed uh, a uh, newspaper editor for printing bad stuff about him. And the San Francisco private, the, it was actually, it was called the Vigilance Committee. They were like, this is terrible. The government is lawless. And so what they did is they had a whole private trial, private tribunal. Uh, they put him in a private jail. In this case, they, <laughs> they actually ended up hanging the guy. Um, so I'm not, I'm not saying that's the optimal solution, but there are cases of this if you believe that the death penalty is necessary. There have been historical examples of that. Yeah. But even then, if it's say in San Francisco, a citizen's participation in that system is not voluntary, it's coercive. I can't live in the city in a neighborhood protected by private police and opt out of that system. If I'm in that neighborhood, I'm governed by that system, and in fact, I'm taxed for that system, I have to pay. Uh, part of what you said is, 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 is true, but nobody was taxed. It was privately financed um, by merchants. So if, if there was... Okay, because I guess what I really wanted to get to is that the, I think the essential underlying principle for, from an economic transactional sense is just we have to guarantee a certain amount of personal property rights. And I, I'm not clear how you're suggesting on, a, on the simplest day-to-day -day level, as, as I think he was trying to get at, um, if I'm living in a poor neighborhood and I'm concerned about my neighbors breaking in mm -hmm. uh, and taking all of my stuff every time I leave to go to work, um, <clears throat> I'm not clear how we establish adequate guarantees in that regard with a strictly private system. I mean, for starters, we're appealing to an old body of common law as to what is appropriate behavior, mm -hmm. and then we would need somebody to arbitrate that, and whether it's a private judge or a public judge, still we're appealing to that body of, of common law that goes back, and we're assuming that all persons are included in that, whether they wish to be or not, and we're not simply going to show them out of town. And I think if we developed a habit of foisting our problems off on our neighbors, eventually they would stop accepting them, and we would have to come up with a solution that I'm guessing probably closely resembles the one we already have. Uh, well, uh, I, I appreciate your comment. Uh, in terms of people having security in poor neighborhoods, right now that is a problem. If you look at certain neighborhoods, government police doesn't, they don't really even go into them. So uh, a, a lot of people uh, really are in a state of anarchy. They don't have any options. There have been examples of, um, uh, housing communities that said, we're going to have private patrol, sure. and it's going to be voluntary uh, participation. Well, and but here's, here, here's one example that I do want to mention. It was at a, a public housing project, and then the government came in and said, this is a government housing. You can't have your own voluntary security in the government housing. So in that case, they had to have a situation with no security. In my ideal world, you're going to have lots of private communities, such as Disney, such as a college. And in this community, the landlord can provide private security. So the so doorman. Within the uh, apartment, the rent is being paid by the customer who's paying uh, for the private security. So if you internalize the externality, uh, you don't have as many of those problems. But I'll, I'll get back to you. I want to uh, get some other people over here. Yeah? Um, what role does uh, ethics play in this if everyone has their own private 
business to um, kind of feed into. You know, if you have a business, you're going to want to have a business. So. Yeah, uh, I actually think that ethics makes the, the better, the more moral people are, the easier commerce becomes. If everybody's out to get everyone else, you could hire a lot of private security and it might work, but it's going to be costly. So the more ethical people are, I think the easier things become. And I actually argue that uh, Thomas Paine was right when he said that most peaceful behavior is because people want to be peaceful. Now, obviously, there's exceptions. There's certain people who just don't want to follow the rules. But the more ethical people are, I think, the easier this becomes. So the Amish people uh, in 1600s in, and 1700s, they just created their own private communities. And they didn't really even have policemen for, for, for the most part. Um, so I think that the more ethical people are, the easier it becomes. In terms of uh, getting back to your question earlier, um, an advantage of this is it allows different people to have different sets of rules. So certain colleges have very strict rules. You can't drink on campus. You can't do this on campus. Other colleges say, well, you know, do whatever you want. And in this case, the consumer is allowed to opt in to the ethical system that they like. If they want to be in a very strict environment, they can. A more loose environment, they can as well. Uh, yeah. So how would you, um, you know, if, if you've got different companies competing and things like that, like to go back to the Amish, they did it for their survival, whereas in this case you're doing it for profit. So in, in a sense, wouldn't it kind of like, you know, um, it would kind of tend to benefit towards the wealthy rather than the poor. So it wouldn't really be, you know, and even if you have different groups doing this, it wouldn't really be equality for all. Does that make sense? You have different rules, different sets, different um, a, like level, you know what I mean? You'd only be able, to be able to attain a certain level of security because of your financial standards instead of everybody having the same level of security. I, I do agree that, that there would not be equality of, you know, the person who, and, and currently right now, the person who hires their own private bodyguard has more security than the person who doesn't. So I, I agree there's going to be different levels of uh, service. But I think actually... Uh, Poor people would be the people who would benefit the most from this. If you look at certain demographic groups, there's huge problems with the police. They, they, you can ask them, and they say they don't like the police. They're imprisoned a lot by the police. What's that? More in like a sense of like a, a court case. You know what I mean? If there's like somebody who's a big benefactor, let's say in a security company, who is caught breaking the laws or something like that, and they're under the rule of their own security company, you know, I mean, it seems like they would be. You know what I mean? It'd be, you'd be a lot less likely to try that person or to, you know what I mean, to have that compared to somebody who has never put anything forward, any kind of money forward towards this company or anything like that. I mean, it seems like it would be easier I to that. I think that, one, that uh, that's certainly possible, but uh, in the same way, Disney does not want their security guards abusing their customers. Uh, these other security firms wouldn't have an incentive to be viewed as corrupt. If they're viewed as corrupt, who's going to want to deal with a company like that? If you get beat up by the Disney police, that's going to decrease the value of the shares of the Disney company. So uh, there's a built-in incentive for that. I certainly wouldn't want to hire a company who could beat me up, and then they would have their own trial and then decide that I'm guilty, right? This is actually what government does. Government police tries their own police in their own courts, and they say, oh, well, then you can't sue us. So if anything, I think that uh, these abuses are much worse under a governmental system. Uh, yeah? What about jurisdictional systems? Do you agree with different policies? So you know, if I live on one side and my neighbor lives on the other, and I agree to this private security firm, he's going to agree with that one. Isn't there still that same conflict of jurisdiction? Just because it has, they're getting paid more doesn't change the fact that there's still that conflict. Yeah, there's going to be, uh, and that is also the case in the current world. There's, as long as there's more than one government in the current world, which there is, there's going to be different jurisdictions. And then the question is, how do you deal with the dividing line? In many cases, uh, in the current world, you've got people right next to each other, and then there's this line right through it. That's probably more likely to 
lead to conflict. But what Disney did when they created uh, Disney World in Florida, they decided to buy up a huge plot of land so they could, to use the economic term, internalize externalities within their set of land. So there's, you know, the bigger it is, the easier uh, I, I could see it would work. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, three things. Um, first of all, the, uh, the pictures you used from the World Cup example, which was, what, five years ago, the, uh, the guy laying on the ground was Italian. <laughs> 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 the old guy was uh, Zidane. Zidane. He had voted the other guy because uh, he called his sister a whore. So if you're going to somebody for being French, you should make sure that they're French. <laughs> um, <laughs> secondly, uh, GM paid back almost all of the bailout money that the government invested in their industry. I think you're conflating a government investment with a government tax. Actually, that's that's not at all true. Yeah, they made they, a, uh, they, one payment a couple months ago, what, $500 billion? No, no, that's not close. They, they got around $50 billion total, and uh, they've paid back around $25 or $30 billion. And they, pay, they quote, paid back their loans with more government bailout loans. So uh, the uh, Obama administration just admitted that they're not going to get all their money back. So. Uh, the bondholders on that too didn't get anything. Yeah, exactly. So. All right, thirdly, um, all the, uh, the private security companies, you, uh, you talk about you know, the uh, Disney uh, mall, mall cops, you know, campus security, they're all, they're all subject to the jurisdiction of larger police in general, and they may be a good deterrent for, you know, petty crimes, but I mean, you know, campus security didn't stop the Columbine shooters from coming in. You know, mall cops didn't stop this, you know, psychopath from two weeks ago for trying to bomb a mall. Yeah, I'm not arguing that, that private security can eliminate all problems in the same way that it would be a folly to argue that government can eliminate all problems. So to mention examples of crime and say, oh, it can't be solved, I think that's probably true. Um, I think that it was, it's a relative comparison. I would argue that I'm, I feel much safer in a place that's policed privately than a pl place that's not really policed with government. Uh, well, yeah. Private cops aren't, I mean, okay. every single one of the, of the you know, people running for you know, the, the mayoral election right now, every single one of them has said that they're gonna remove the, the Denver chief of police. You know, I mean, they're subject to the electorate, you know, whereas if it's private, they're subject to the shareholders. Yeah, yeah and I would argue that uh, markets there, provide... economic incentive to go after terrorists, so. I would argue that markets provide much better incentives than the political process. So, um, you know, the mall is always clean, the mall is always safe. Not always, but almost always safe, whereas... Government police, they've got their own agenda, whether it's increasing their pensions. In San Francisco, this woman just retired. Her pension is $230,000 per year, and she's 53, and she gets that for the rest of her life. So one could argue, oh, you know, they're in it for their public good, or we could argue that they're in it to benefit themselves, and I think that seems like a pretty clear example. Yeah? Uh, all the examples that you mentioned, exists right now, they already have the layer of the government provision of the yeah. gap. So how much success do you I have two questions. How much success would you attribute to having that additional level of the public security to the success of the private security? And my second question kind of was follows you once again mentioned a lot of successful examples of the private provision of the good. Which areas do you think we still would benefit having private security where we still don't have that private security? Can you give examples of where would you like to see that extra private provision of that? Right? Um, so I'll answer the second question first. I think that the reason this is not more common is uh, there's certain legal restrictions in certain areas. So colleges have uh, pretty well the ability to police themselves. In certain colleges, I mentioned Wake Forest University fully deputized private police with full police powers, private. Um, what's that? Oh, okay, okay, so there's examples uh, of this. In certain areas, there's restrictions, so it's hard. 
in uh, San Francisco, for example, I've been studying the pr private police there, and they're facing a lot of difficulties by the government police are preventing them from hiring additional private police. Uh, they prevent, uh, they, they just have a lot of rules that make it difficult for private police to do what they want. In, uh, whenever we've got public streets, that creates problems because who sh who's the owner of the street? Who should be policing that street? I think that makes things very difficult. In my ideal world, we would see more private streets like we see in shopping malls and things like that. And then to be very clear, the, the mall owner provides security uh, for the private police. Uh, so I think we could expand it greatly if we just eliminate some of the regulations. Uh, to answer your question about does this work because of the government, and that's certainly possible. We can't rule that out just based on our current observations. Uh, however, I actually think that I would attribute most of the success to the private and not the, the government. And if we look back in history, actually, there were plenty of examples of purely almost purely private systems. So in ancient uh, England, a thousand years ago, ancient Ireland, these are just some, some articles that are reprinted in my book. Uh, ancient Iceland, they're societies that existed for hundreds of years with no government at all. Uh, they weren't perfect in any way, but they did have a very sophisticated dispute resolution mechanism. So I think that we could really uh, probably make a lot of inferences that if it worked there, I wouldn't be surprised if it could work uh, here. Um, I, uh, I don't know if I'd want to live in ancient Iceland, um, but given that people were so uh, barbaric uh, a thousand years ago, I don't think that... Uh, we, I mean, if you look at ancient Iceland, it was, it was definitely problematic, but it did have similar sets of enforcement mechanisms uh, that we see in a lot of these other uh, cases uh, throughout the world. So a lot of people point out to uh, a cu current example is Somalia. Somalia, pretty much a lot of the gov uh, country doesn't have a government, and they do have a lot of similar enforcement mechanisms as in ancient Iceland and a lot of these other ones. And so the criticism, people say, oh, you like it so much, you want to live in Somalia. <laughs> and my answer is, no, 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 I don't want to live in Somalia. Um, but it's a relative comparison. Would I rather be in Somalia with the government or in Somalia without a government? And I'd actually say I'd rather be in Somalia without a government. So there's actually been increases in investment in electricity, water, telephones, things like that since they got rid of the government. So it's relative. Um, so yeah, this is certainly not a great place to live, but uh, maybe it was better without the government than with the government. Yeah? Uh, a couple of points I want to circle back to the point you made, but talking about, you, I, you notice, I, I've noticed that you uh, highlight successful stories, and I'm having a hard time thinking of a counterexample of a, an unsuccessful but I'm sure that there have been unsuccessful events that we haven't heard about. It seems to me that historically, in the United States and I think around the world, uh, large-scale businesses have displayed a tendency over the last 20 years to think short-term and not medium and long-term benefit, evidence the housing bubble and, and associated financial crisis that grew entirely out of markets, which some people say didn't have enough regulation. I don't think the problem was caused by regulation in any case. Um, but. Setting that example partly aside, I wanted to circle back to a point that I, uh, somebody in the back of the room made me think of, which is that one of the things that Disney's private security does very well is actually keep information from the public. If somebody dies and has a, you know, a terrible heart attack or whatever, they swoop in, hide the event because they don't want to disrupt anybody else's day. Likewise, any other unpleasant event is very well concealed from the public. And I think that that asymmetry of information, what they do versus what we perceive, could distort business practices like this very easily if one's primary focus of business was hiding unpleasant events from the public. To what extent would market forces really interfere? I certainly think that uh, businesses will always want to put their best f face forward. So. Um, there may be some unpleasantries at Disney that we don't know about. 
On the other hand, I do think that if things are important enough, there are ways of sharing information about companies. So Consumer Reports is created to say, hey, these auto companies say their car is perfect, but we found you know, 50 problems per car, whatever it is. And there are mechanisms of uh, uh, sharing information, restaurant reviews. Uh, there's all these things that the restaurant wants you to think, but if you go to the online review, you can say, well, here's the alternative well, side. Those involve actually testing the product, whereas to actually test a security product, I would have to send in private evaluators to commit crimes and find out the <laughs> And that seems fantastically impractical. Um, I think, I, I, I don't think Disney is quite as scary as you think it is. Oh, I don't um, think it's particularly scary. I'm just saying that there's an intrinsic asymmetry of information there. But that's why the problem with this everywhere, though, even in Denver. So, you can't, so by assigning that or, or like just saying that privately that wouldn't exist, that's not true. I mean, it exists in, in the public sector. Well, I service. guess I feel that in the public sector, we have built a robust mechanism that allows at least some recourse even against that asymmetry of information. I would argue the word robust. I mean, I don't think that that's necessarily inherently true. Yeah, I mean, if you look at police abuse, uh, high incarceration rates, I mean, there's more people in, in uh, prison in the United States than anywhere else, so I, I, don't, I don't think we can... Yeah. Did, uh, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I got Okay, go ahead. Um, I think there is a good example of, of a problem with private security. It was like the uh, Blackwater Company, although they're government funded, mm -hmm. so it's not perfect, but I think they've proven like what the most economically efficient means of security is they basically just shoot people that look like offenders, right? Yeah, I, I think that Blackwater is horrible. I agree with that. Um, and that's one of these questions of do we call that private or public? It's financed by the government. They're hired by the government. Their mission is driven by the government. Now, the people working for them are private parties. But we could also say that about army, you know, soldiers. They're, they're private individuals working for the government in the same way that... Blackwater has shareholders, and the government is the primary customer, but they do have other customers. Sure, yeah. They're not, I'm not saying they're the same, but they're kind of one of these in-between cases in just the way that the for-profit prison is. Uh, and that's another area which I am not willing to endorse because they do a lot of bad things. Yeah? To kind of tie into that example, who would provide oversight? Because in the end, it was the government that found out about it, and it was the public outcry. Same thing with police beings in Denver especially. They all found out, public found out, and that's when there was outcry for it. So what's to say that a public sector security company, or a private sector security company, assaults you know, a woman on the street or a, a homosexual downtown at a bar, like happened here recently, like who's to say that they're not going to have any oversight without the government there? Yeah, I, I think the ultimate, for me, for everything, the ultimate constraint on everything, including government, is public outcry. So if we just let government police abuse people and no one does anything, they're going to continue doing that. But if people say, no, we don't like that, we're upset about this, we're going to protest this, I think that does provide one constraint. It's not perfect, but it does provide one constraint against government uh, abuse. Uh, and I think that we would want to have the same thing with, with private police. Um, I, I would also add that the profit incentive actually creates, it, uh, creates more incentive for customer satisfaction that is not, 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 not there with government. You can pay me 40 Gs a year, and if I don't like somebody, I'm still going to beat them up. Like, that's, it blows up. <laughs> it's just going to provide that internal security to oversight. I mean, if, if your company... Uh, if, you, if you're damaging your, the customers of your employer, they're not going to want to have you. I mean, this is, this is a fact that we have. That's not true, though, because if there is nothing better, if there's not a be really a necessarily a better option, then people are just going to do it. People work horrible jobs. They're like, well, I don't, there's really not anything better, but I'm going to continue to do it. And then you say that, like, poor um, neighborhoods, going to Disney... I'm sorry, I just feel like that's a horrible example because it costs money. Poor people don't go to Disney. When you go to Disney, it's an arm and a leg to even 
get in. Everything costs a lot. How are these poor neighborhoods going to pay for this? I think that it's, it's like this ideal. The government may not work, but private industry, where do you stop? They, I mean, they, they actually have examples of uh, poor communities that have self-provision of private dispute resolution mechanisms. It's not for profit. It's non-profit. So what's that? They're gay. Yeah. So, there are nicer examples of that. Um, and also, where, some so of your sure. cases are, I mean, 1805. It's not 1805 anymore. I mean, population is increased. I mean, and you want these gated communities, or you're saying these private communities. Where's the democratic voice? I mean, where do people help each other out? Like. It's, to me, it sounds more like, okay, well, I'm going to live in my community. I'm going to have the better security. I'll pay more. And the poor people, I'm not even going to go over there. I'm not going to worry about it. I mean, if, to there, be honest with you, I think the common good is kind of an ideal. Like the, when there's no government enforcement, it's chaos. There would be private communities in my ideal system where people wouldn't leave as, as there exists Currently, right now, there are private communities that people don't yeah, need. Yeah, they're awful. They're like so expensive, gated, people, golf people course People like them. It's terrible. People Why? are willing to pay yeah, more money to live in you them. Wanting because to live you in don't, private because community. You, you live within your walls. You're not exposed to the rest of the world. Well, I think that's terrible. Well, I, it's their choice to do that. Well, it's their human choice but to see, go that's and the live thing, though. That's a problem, is that you're not worried about the other people in the other neighborhood not getting treated right. Okay, that's their personal choice. You can't take their personal choice. Get out of the poor area. <laughs> it's hard for poor people to get out of the poor area now, yeah, anyway. That's what poor so, people say, you know, usually, but not everybody else. So, well, well, you know, that's, it brings the question of, of equity to the poor, I think, and that's one of the interesting things. And I, I'm not so sure that the main argument about police forces is importance as it is equity. And, and so, um, you can have this variation, and that's fine. And I think you've not. I mean, I think we all stipulate to the private. Security will lead to inequity or diversity, however you want to think about it. Um, but what happens to that in juxtaposed with things like property rights? So I want to live here. This is my right to live here. I happen to be African American in an all white uh, neighborhood. I don't have to go to the 1600s. I can go back 30 years. Uh, and the majority in that neighborhood have agreed to hire a private police force that is intent on removing African Americans from my neighborhood. Um, how does how does private police force work there? With well, I, I, I would judges? I would mention that the Jim Crow laws, for example, were enforced by government. Well, you know, I, want, I want to know how the private sector would deal with this. I understand that there's compar relative comparatives, and it's all made right. by and, and the, it, the bus the private bus companies were in favor of of integration because they wanted more customers. So I certainly think that that would be the most profitable thing today. On the other hand, I do agree that if if certain person wants to just be by themselves and not want anyone on their property, that's also an option. I'm not saying I'm not saying I want to live in this place where I never leave, but certain people if that's what they want to do, uh, that's what they're going to do. Um, so I would just say, let people do what they want to do. And if people want to have a country club with people who look like them, I think that's personally wrong, and I don't support that. But that's what people currently do. They've always done, and I think they always uh, will do. So I would say that that's just an option that we would give people. If people want to pay more to live in these insular com communities, that's their prerogative. I don't want to force them to do otherwise. I don't want to live in an insular community. I want to live in a city where I get to interact with people. Uh, I think probably most people are like that. I'm not worried about the opting in. I'm worried about pushing out. And I guess that would be the, the question of why you would have an overarching kind of basis level of law and some sort of enforcement for that. Um, so even post Jim Crow, um, I mean, it was government, for instance, that, that stopped the restricted deeds for the US Constitution, not the private sector that was tracking those kind of activities. So I just don't, I don't know how it plays out. I'm not an optimist when it comes to things like racial and, and class relations, and I don't think that it's fundamentally driven by the public sector. I think that's, you know. Uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of difficult questions, but, you know, if we want to say 
what's going to be better or worse, there are, you can ask certain communities, African Americans, for example, there's a very high dissatisfaction rate with government police. There's more African Americans in prison right now than there were enslaved 100, you know, 150, 180 years ago. So to me, this is a, but still. Perfect, but I think he does raise an excellent point about equity, um, or and, and some minimum guarantee of equality. Um, I think I'm probably the only Arab American in the room. And if all of you were collectively in agreement that your private security is best preserved by excluding me from this room, I would have no recourse and there would be no profit motive there's no amount of economic influence that I could bring to bear that would change that system. And I would simply not be allowed in this room. And I think that that, in the long run, would end up being a loss for all of us. I, I think that would be terrible and sad um, if people were to make that decision. Um, but I think that there's certain people who do make that decision right now, and I think it's terrible and sad. Um, but luckily, I think most people have more enlightened preferences than that, and uh, wouldn't want to demand those types of rules. So uh, I, I, I agree with you guys. What's that? Um, I would say that there's lots of people I might want to associate with, but they don't want to associate with me, and I'm saddened by that. And I, I just have to say I can't. I can't interact with those people. And I think that you know, that's just going to be something that we might have to deal with. And I, I don't support it. I'm not jumping up and down and saying, like, oh, it's great that people. solution in the system to address that mechanism. Right. I, I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you. And that comes down to enforcement again. If we, as a community, decide that we don't want like, an African American in our community, we're paying the bills the security company and there we say we're going to leave the security company we're going to leave this place if you don't kick them out what what can they do yeah i think i mean i think if a and this is this is the case up until recently Co certain country clubs would be only one demographic and i think that's sad and rude and unfortunate but that's just the way they interacted and it still to a large extent still exists today um, i don't support it but I think certain people, if they want to do their bigoted thing, they're going to do their bigoted thing. I would hope that we can convince people not to do that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I agree that's a possibility that would be unfortunate. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I just wanted to say, I'm not sure if it was you or if it was the student affairs office who supplied the pizza, but whoever did, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, well, and I think what we're talking about is the tyranny of the majority, and I don't see how it's in the best interest of business to not rule in the majority favor. I mean, if, you know, we all say, you know, it's not good for business to, you know, include Muslims or whomever, you know, we decide. Doesn't seem like there's any mechanism to prevent that. You know, it doesn't seem like there's any... Well, I, w I would argue that the profit mechanism, profit people see green rather than other things. I would actually argue that politics makes things, what's that? I would, I would argue that with politics, these problems get worsened. So right now we've got the government deciding our uh, relations and like, oh, we've got to prevent immigration. We have to have racial profiling. I think all this is horrible. Um, and that's done through government. Uh, just because we have government and the majority deciding things doesn't solve these problems. Whereas with markets, you've got people, they don't necessarily have the same uh, demographic background, but they're interested in serving other people because they want to make money. So I would argue that these problems, uh, the incentives under markets are actually eliminate or reduce not completely eliminate, but to reduce these problems more than under government. Well, what I'm saying is if there's no economic incentive for equality, then there's no equality. Yeah, I, I guess I would agree with that. Did Does it mean force equality on the world? Is that what you think? The ideal world, everybody's equal? Is I'm that not the ideal world? forcing it. I'm just saying that we should allow for a free flow of ideas. I'm not talking about imposing anything. So I, I think that I would agree. Well, I think the government, do, the government does solve those problems. And uh, I mean, well, you, you can look at the civil rights movement. I mean, 
it was a thrill, uh, you know, strategic paper opportunity, you know, all the much work that they do to uh, get equality. Um, and if it wasn't for, uh, you know, Supreme Court decisions and uh, government interventions in many areas, I mean, we would probably still have um, a society in which it is uh, separated as, 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 you know, just because though there is an economic incentive, and there was back then, and we were still, um, I don't want to say polarized, but we were still se separated just based on the fact that, I mean, one person didn't like the color of one person's skin. So there's a lot of econo economic incentive, but um, they still didn't, <coughs> didn't buy it. So, I mean, government did do, do government did solve the problem, and they... <coughs> I would, I mean, I agree with pretty much everything you just said, except... Um, I think what a lot of the good things they did were getting rid of bad government laws, like the Jim Crow laws, which enforced on businesses who wanted to be integrated, they enforced on businesses segregation. The businesses didn't want to be segregated. They said, more customers, more money. Um, so, but it was the government that prevented uh, integration. So all those improvements are good. I support that. Um, but, you know, go, it would, I would argue without government to begin with, we wouldn't have had, without the Jim Crow laws to begin with, we wouldn't have had as many problems to begin with. Yeah, and many of the Jim Crow laws were specifically passed in some of those southern states to stop the integration and particularly the integration of, in many cases, what were highly skilled blacks moving off the plantations they were free and were successfully competing and taking economic opportunities so what essentially happened with those laws were people who were losing out in the competitive economic arena passed laws to prevent economic interactions between the black and white and in, in a way they created this separate and so as Ed's kind of pointing out that what you saw in many of the civil rights legislation was really primarily rolling back restrictions that had been put in place by law to prevent some of the things that you're implementing that package. If you look back at the Jim Crow laws, the same people voting for that are the business owners because that's the population in that area. It's not random people from the north, you know, you know. It's it's the same people that approve those laws that are running the businesses and everything, you know. Those are their laws, the people who make the laws. Uh, there probably were some overlap, but uh, the economic studies that I've read uh, showed that people, the businesses wanted to hire people, uh, they wanted to get customers who they thought were good customers, and the law was preventing them from doing that. So um, I, I don't think that there's a one-to-one -one overlap between that. Yeah, go ahead. So what would be your uh, ideal route, I guess, to, you know, to see this happen? Like, what would be the route that you would want to see this take? So my idea would be to have what we have now and just allow people to opt into this a little bit more. So opt into a... A uh, homeowners association that can create and enforce rules. You could have a non-drinking homeowners association, a drinking homeowners association. As we have seen over the past 20, 30 years, we have more and more private communities. Uh, some of them are very strict. You have to have white blinds in your window. Do I want to have white blinds in my window? No. Um, but someone who wants to have white blinds in their window and they want their neighbors to have it, uh, just allow more and more of this. So we've seen an increase in this and uh, allow people to opt into it more. So, all right, well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.